So my speciality is I come from back. Uh, my background is uh, probability and statistics, but nowadays I also do some applied mathematics. Uh, so uh, yeah, I use probabilistic methods t uh, to try to s l study models for infectious diseases to see what happens, and also from the other side, you're a statistician, you observe what happens. And then you want to infer the underlying mechanisms. Is it highly transmit? Is it a highly transmittable disease? Uh, where is transmission going on? How long is the duration of the infectious period? And these type of things. Okay, so we use uh, mathematical methods in general. I like stochastic methods, uh, including randomness, because that's my background. But other people do deterministic models. Uh, so. But if you, if you use complicated model, then typically you would simulate the outcome because it's too hard to analyze it analytically. So you would simulate your model to see what happens and see if it fits with reality. Whereas if you use simpler models, then you might be able to get analytical solutions from which you might learn a bit more. So I think both of these methods are good. The simpler models, you get some analytical understanding of what features are most important. But then if you want to mimic reality, you should put in a lot of more things into it to make it more realistic models. And usually you can then not get any analytical things. So then you would simulate it and compare with the corresponding data curves to see if that agrees with the reality. And uh, one reason for doing this is, of course, that you want to understand how disease spreads, but maybe even more so, you want to be able to reduce the spreading. So, for instance, at this workshop, the current uh, topic is, of, is of course, uh, uh, quite a lot about coronavirus and the outbreak. So then the question is, what measures would reduce spreading? And um, some uh, people in this workshop are quite heavily involved with the, the coronavirus, whereas others <coughs> work on models sort of in more long-term perspective. But the ones that are, have been involved in the coronavirus, the questions of interest there is, have, has China done enough to reduce spreading? And it's believed that the spreading is reduced because they have put in a lot of protective measures in China. But then the fear is, since there are so many cases in China, what if it goes outside by chance to a few other countries? And uh, in the other countries, not much preventive measures have put in, been put in place since there is no outbreak there. But suppose there are some cases going into Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia. Are they as efficient uh, in stopping <coughs> spread? And if it comes to these countries, eventually it will also come to Europe. And maybe we are not, if there's many cases coming to Europe, we will also get, start to see outbreaks. So I think now, now is the time, it will soon be decided if it will decline or if it will uh, spread globally. So these type of questions we address at this workshop, both from an applied point of view, but perhaps also more, more on a theoretical point of view to understand what features are important for reducing spreading. Uh, I guess if you were to mention one important quantity is, is uh, what is called the basic reproduction number. That notion is very important. And what is it? It quantifies, on average, how many people an infected infects in the beginning of an outbreak. So if this number is, let's say, three, which is a current guess for coronavirus, that means that you have to reduce this number by two thirds. You have to reduce it down to below one, because if you on average infect less than one individual, then you will not have an outbreak. It's only if you infect on average more than one person that it will grow exponentially. So for instance, coronavirus, I think R0 is expected to be between 2.5 and 3, which then says spreading has to be reduced by, let's say, 60-70% in order for it to decline. So the concept of the basic reproduction number is an important uh, uh, quantity. And, uh, 
and I guess the other main things f for biology and medicine is to sort of evaluate different me protective measures. How effective is a vaccine? That's another quite important thing. So then you, you, you have these clinical trials, you give a new vaccine to a group of people and the old vaccine or no vaccine to the others and you see uh, how effective is the vaccine and that's not a trivial thing to estimate. If a new infectious disease enters a community, either you have no outbreak or else you have a rather big outbreak because there is no immunity in the, in the community. And after this big outbreak, it could either vanish away or el and swipe out a lot of people getting infected, but then it sort of declines, or else it, it can infect a lot of people, but then it can stay around in the community because new in people enter the community by birth and by immigration. So eventually a disease can become endemic, which for instance, all the childhood diseases are endemic. And then an important question is, suppose you have an endemic childhood disease, or also influenza is in some sense epidemic, or there is big seasonal variations. So then a question is, let's say for whooping cough, what can you do to make, or measles, or cholera, or those things, how can you eliminate these diseases? And of course you have to reduce the spreading, either by vaccination or by uh, trying to isolate infected cases and contact tracing, the same applies to HIV. So if someone is infected by, or also Ebola, if someone is infected by Ebola or HIV or cholera, you do what's called contact tracing. You try to isolate these people, but you also ask who were you infected by, and then you try to isolate also these cases and to understand sort of on a mathematical basis what type of measures are most effective in reducing spread, spread. I think that is one area where mathematics has contributed, but also can contribute more. Another thing that we are discussing here at this workshop is, so you know, from a mathematical modeling point of view, you can learn quite a lot, but then you have to fit it to reality. And then data comes into, uh, comes into play. And then there are some problems with data. One thing is that, one big problem with data is that you don't observe all infected people. So there are a lot of, for instance, also now with coronavirus, you observe a lot of people having coronavirus, but more or less certainly there are other people having coronavirus with lower symptoms that also contribute to spreading. And since you don't know how many they are, typically you would attribute their infections also to the reported cases. So you make some mistakes there. And uh, so I think that is a rather important thing. Another important thing is when you get data for new, in new outbreaks, you don't have a random sample of individuals. For instance, the cases you observe, they typically have much worse symptoms than the typical infected person. Also, the people that get infected in the early stage of an outbreak, they have much more contacts with others. For instance, I'm old enough to have experienced the HIV outbreak, and I remember the first few infected cases with HIV, they had had like 100 sex partners in a year, uh, and that's not the typical number of sex partners, but the ones that get infected early on are atypical because they, are, they expose themselves much more. And to try to understand that, and when you estimate things, you must realize that the people that we observe are different from the average Joe in the community. So that is one area where I think statisticians can uh, contribute to uh, the modeling and learning more about the outbreaks as well. So we are organizing this workshop here. I think we are between 50 and 60 participants coming from many different countries, uh, also with rather different backgrounds. Some are theoretical mathematicians, others are applied mathematicians like myself, others are computer scientists that are good at simulating and analyzing data, others are sort of epidemiologists. And 
we commonly share this interest for infectious diseases and I think it's very good that we have this broad spectrum of individuals. Some knows uh, how to uh, do an advanced mathematical model and uh, someone else knows this is an important question about the coronavirus. So by meeting each other, I think we, first of all, we stimulate each other, but also the hope, one of the main hope with a workshop like this is to connect uh, new uh, collaborations uh, that will make progress in research in the future. And I think that is also happening at this workshop and at many workshops. So to create new collaborations, preferably with people of different background. And I think that will uh, contribute to science making progress. So that I think is the main uh, reason for having such an org uh, a workshop like this and of course I think all of us also enjoy it very much. We meet new people and hear a lot of interesting talks and many of us are sort of a little bit isolated in our departments. Maybe we have one or two PhD students that we collaborate with but the rest, for instance, I'm in a math department, <coughs> other people do other things so not that many people in my department are interested in these type of questions, but when I come here, I realize that there are people that have seen the light just like me that like these type of modeling. So that's also another important thing with these type of workshops.